Welcome back to another episode of Let's Talk Hoops with Combino Memory and myself, Chris Foss. Joining us today, we have Mafang Doka, Benson Tech, PIL, and DePaul Hall of Famer. And also our first Olympian is joining us. She was 2004 Olympic participant with Nigeria. Uh, Mafang, welcome on. Hello. Um, you missed a couple Hall of Fames, though. Man, add them on. Throw them on there. We, we need to know why. Uh, I am... FIBA Africa, one of the top 50 players in 50 years of existence. That was back in 2011. And then I'm also been given this, I guess they kind of call it this Golden Basket Legend Award that I got in 2015, um, just for kind of, you know, putting Nigeria on the map. So I still get recognized for that stuff. And um, yeah, I just came back from Afro Basket because of that, too. Yeah, well, tell us a little about that. I know that you had a chance to go out there. Nigeria won their fourth Afro basket in a row, but but kind of what was what was your role for going out there, and how was that um, going back again? Well, they usually uh, FIBA Africa usually kind of invites certain players back. Um, they call us legends um, from different countries: Senegal, Mozambique, um, Mali, Nigeria. And so they just kind of like us to be around the game a little bit, um, especially just because, you know, we've kind of, the people they invite back have done a little bit of something to put their countries on the map or um, just personal achievements and um, before and after our playing days. For sure. Hey, I like how you fucked them up right from the get-go because normally I try to fuck up his intro every time and you got to it before I did <laughs> Yeah, um, you know, we, in African basketball, um, Senegal has 11 titles, and most of their success has come in the early 70s, 80s, um, so we're now at six with Nigeria, having won four in a row, um, and two back-to-back when I played um, in 2003 and 2005, so we're trying to, you know, catch them, in in, in my opinion, um, but uh, West Africa generally is has uh, basketball on the map as far as Africa goes. Um, like I said, I just came from Rwanda, and Rwanda was a beautiful experience, beautiful country, um, clean, like there's no trash anywhere, which is just unheard of. Um, there's nobody out there begging on the streets for, you know, trying to hawk you or sell stuff, you know, because a lot of times you'll see those things on the side of the road and none of that going on. Um, they got a beautiful facility and they have a president who gets it, like who understands what sports is about and the business of sports and just sports in general. So, um, what they don't have is the talent of West Africa and even I'd say Northern Africa, some Arab countries like Tunisia, Egypt, Morocco, a little bit, they've got organization and they have facilities, but what they don't have is the talent of West Africa. So, um, on the men's side, Tunisia, I think, is the reigning champion for the male, for men's Afro basket. But, um, you know, West Africa is where all the raw talent is, for sure. On that, in your opinion, what do you feel like is the biggest separator right now in talent, especially on the women's side, from the West African countries and, like you're saying, with, with the rest of the continent? I mean, I'd say just the amount of people that are in West Africa. I mean, Nigeria is the most populous black nation in the in the world. Um, 200, over 200, I think it's 20 million now, 220 million. Um, so if you just think about that type of population and what you have to pick from. Um, and what Nigeria, Nigeria also has is the, that we can come and take talent from whatever. So like, America, for example, they take a lot of players from America um, of Nigerian origin, and I don't think many other countries have that at their disposal. Um, but what we do have is raw talent, the athleticism, um, height, like Senegalese people are really tall and lean. Um, Nigerians are very um, all over the place just because there's so many people. But um, I'd say what West Africa is lacking the most is organization. Um, if we could somehow put that together, it would be, you know, a, an amazing thing to see, but we're still working on that part. I was trying to find that. I just saw that that president from 
um, Rwanda had made that quote regarding sports. Do mm -hmm. you remember? Mm -hmm. It was like powerful. Yeah, I, I had actually taken a video of that on, um, it was in the gym and it's something about, you know, just, just, just what the power of sport is. And it's nothing about necessarily winning. It's just the character, the things that it builds, the, the, the you know, just character building um, for the most. So yeah, he gets it. Um, most presidents don't. Nigerian president definitely does not. Um, if, if one leader would just get behind sports and make it a uh, culture, it, it would just be such a game changer. And we had a panel that there was, it was about mostly about women's basketball and the role of women in basketball in Africa and how they're trying to grow that. And um, the whole thing is that I was, I was telling them because I was the only one that was born in America. I mean, sport is our culture here. It's, it's just ingrained. Like you can play any level, anywhere, any age. Um, and that's what's missing. Like you don't feel that there when you're there, you know that it could be um, like injected into the culture there more. It could be. It it just it, when you think about it though, it's like when you have countries that have basic needs that aren't being met. You know, it's kind of hard to say, hey, here's sports. You know, but eventually, if it ever gets to that, um, it has to be something that's supported by the government. And the government is just so horrible over there. They just they just don't do anything for the people. Um, but here, you know, I was talking about Portland Parks and Rec, like how we grew up in the park and just like everything. It's just, it's, it's ingrained in our culture. And I think that's the biggest difference, but I think certain places are understanding that. And then there's also the business side of sports that is a whole nother level, but I'm just saying from a grassroots perspective, sports is ingrained in American culture. And I think that that's where you could start. It's very simple too. Um, and I think that's doable. And you're already like starting that and injecting that there with them seeing the crossover, what you've been able to do going over there um, on the continent of Africa and then what you've done back here, back home. Mm -hmm. Speaking about, um, you just talk about like the power of women's basketball. Let's talk about that now because we like, this is a big, big wave. You know, like I remember going to all that stuff with you back in the day and you talk about, I mean, they treat us like shit. <laughs> Beans and stuff, this, that, and other, and like to see where this shit is now, that's gotta like make you extremely happy and like pride. Yeah. I mean, there's 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 still a ways to go, and it's funny because um the Nigerian it's not funny, but the Nigerian men's team just lost two games in their qualifier, so they're out of the Olympic running, and now everybody's like, Oh, that's why we're you know, the women never they always make us proud, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, it's, it's still, a, it has a long way to go. I think, um, certain countries get it. Like I said, Rwanda, they are, their minister of sports is a woman and that's like unheard of, um, anywhere. And then with the Nigerian team, we had a female coach and I'd never thought about this before, but she's the first woman to ever win Afro basket ever. And I thought about like all the years I was playing and who I'd seen on the sidelines. There was never one female head coach, not one. There was always assistants, but never um, a female head coach. And then you think of you, so you think about that, and that's a really big deal. Um, and what we were talking about a lot on the panel was that these that women who are in coaching, they just only think they can be assistants, you know. And I think part of that is cultural because there's not a lot of women in leadership positions, but it's also just like never seeing anyone do it. So it was a really big deal um, for her to win. And this is, she's young and this is her first tournament and this is her first tournament in Africa. So it was a, it was a really big deal. And I'm, I'm glad she was a Nigerian. Uh, we kind of set the pace for a lot of stuff in Africa, um, but I think it opened a lot of eyes and it just made people realize like, oh my God, maybe I could do that too. That was the point I was gonna hit on. I remember you posting something about that, having her be the first woman who, who had won Afro basket. And I think there's there's such a power in being able to see somebody in a spot that's maybe elevated instead of just like you said, just a player, just an assistant coach. Um, 
Do you feel like that has an opportunity to be able to influence the rest of the continent? Or this, I mean, I think that's still even something that's a little bit behind in the sport as a whole, where there's, it's still really a male-dominated coaching profession. Yeah, I, I it definitely is. I also say, I also think that, you know, there are female assistants, like I said, and it's not necessarily on them because you've got men in those leadership positions that are, would be the ones to hire them. So I think that would help, yes, but it's like, again, a lot of um, male dominated in every leadership position is who's gonna be the one that's gonna be okay with that. Sometimes they don't like to have women in you know, positions of leadership because they don't want them to be better. A lot of times we are. <laughs> I used to say uh, we got right now the JV playing varsity. We we need to more. I mean, like look at the acceleration of Becky Hammond's career, and then you know that speech, tearful speech she did did the other day to Pop, and obviously you know we got a lot of connections to that whole scenario and seeing it happen. But uh, we we're looking at stuff that's like revolutionary. This isn't just like oh somebody got an opportunity. This is stuff that's been going on for centuries and now like now finally getting broken. Yeah. Um, again, like we don't have enough women coaches in general, um, even on all levels. And for me, I've never thought about that much because I never really wanted to coach, but I also always grew up with male coaches and I this is not I'm not bashing men at all because I've loved every single coach I've had my high school coach I love my college coach um my Olympic coach so it's not really that 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 I'm you know that we're bashing men I don't I don't believe in that but um there just has to be more of a pathway to to getting there um and I, I think the visibility again I have teammates and friends and coaching that are, you know, all women and they all played. And so I think, you know, it's, it's still a place that's lacking, but I think it's also getting a little better. Take us back if you can. I know you mentioned Nigeria being one of the countries that, that has American born um, players that play with them. Kind of that process of you um, getting connected with, with the Nigerian basketball uh, organization and kind of what that, what that initial process was for you going through that? Um, well, I'd say growing up, I would have, you know, never thought of ever playing for Nigeria. I didn't know even that that was possible. But in 1998, uh, my senior year in college, actually, I was done with my uh, eligibility. So I'd finished. And there was a guy who called me um, from the men's team. His name is Kingsley. And he called DePaul University and left a message and was like, hey, you know, we're looking for players, you know, blah, 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 because I guess he had, you know, gone through a bunch of, you know, trying to find players. And I had my ACL was torn at the time. So they were getting ready to play in the All Africa Games in 2000, and I believe it was in South Africa. And I always kept that in the back of my head, like, okay, so, you know, I'm here right finishing college and tearing your ACL at like the worst time you could when you're trying to make it as a pro, right? So um, I'd always thought about, kept that in the back of my mind. And then when I was in Israel in 2001, I met a Nigerian girl who had actually played for the team. And then we kind of kept in touch. And then in 2003, she played in Seattle and I played in uh, Houston. And so we connected again. And then two weeks after, um, the season was over with the Houston Comets. I went straight to uh, Nigeria for the first time ever. Um, stayed for seven weeks and went to like three different countries. But the first one was Nigeria because we hosted the All Africa Games. And at the time there was about, I think about six teams in the tournament. And she had told me like, if you win this tournament, you go to Olympics. And I was like, all right, bet. So that wasn't true. And she told me that she told me that because she thought I wouldn't come. And my whole thing was like, well, I'm, I mean, this is, you know, a chance to 
go to Africa for the first time, go to Nigeria for the first time. I was like, nothing would keep me from doing that. So um, we won that tournament, which was really cool because it's like an African Olympics. It had like almost, you know, athletes from every sport, from almost every country. Um, so for my first experience in Africa in general, that was it just this was amazing. And it was in Nigeria, so it was even better. Um, and then they told me to, you know, I could go play for this club team. And so I was like, all right, cool. You know, we're going to go to Mozambique and South Africa. So I was like, all right, you know, that's a six hour flight to South Africa, South. And then, you know, another maybe two hours to the, um, West is, no, to the East is, uh, is Mozambique. So the first, the second tournament we played was in Mozambique, but we had our um, training camp and practicing in South Africa. So I got to go around South Africa a little bit, mostly Johannesburg and Pretoria, which is uh, the capital. And then we flew to Mozambique and we won that tournament. So that was the second tournament we'd won for the first time. Like we'd never won anything before. And that was our first um, club championship. And then, so that was about seven weeks, um, met so many amazing people and had so many crazy stories and memories. Um, but um, then I flew back home, I think that was probably sometime in November. And then in, you know, typical Nigeria unorganized fashion, we're sitting there, we're like waiting, waiting, waiting for them to tell us when camp is because we're about to try to go to the Olympics. This is for the, this is, you know, they called it the nation's cup back then. This is like 20 years ago in 2003. Um, they call it Afrobasket now. So we're sitting there waiting to get a call when our camp is going to be, cause we don't have a lot of time. And so fast forward, it's like, maybe 10 days before the tournament <laughs> and we get on a plane and in New York. So I'm, you know, at the time I'm based in Chicago, but I go to New York, I meet our coach, Sam Vincent and, and this other player there. And we're all kind of working out together, like waiting for this phone call. And then we get the call, we, we get on South Africa Airways, and I remember falling asleep. I had exit row. I remember falling asleep for like two hours, and I woke up, and we still hadn't left. And so it's like a 16-hour flight, it's the longest flight I've ever been on. And so then we fly there. We get to South Africa. We have a week to try to go win an Olympic berth, which is, is unheard of. I mean, and that's just typical Nigeria. And sadly, they're still doing the same thing today. I mean, this is 20 years later. They're still doing the same type of thing. So we, um, we got split up. There was two sites, which is, they don't do that anymore, but we were in a city called Nampula in Mozambique. And it was the worst of the worst. Um, and it was like deliberate because they did things like that where they would try to, you know, make your conditions as difficult as possible so the home team could win. Um, I just remember there was just this, like, we were at this hotel and there was the, it was kind of like outdoor, but not outdoor. It was a kitchen and like, there was like just flies everywhere. Like when your food got on the table, it was just like a million. I mean, and I just like, I can't eat this. I can't eat here. I just can't. So I wasn't, I wasn't really eating. I went to the store. Um, I spent like $50, which is a lot of money there on like canned fruit cocktail and like peaches. And I would eat that and have coffee. And then at night there was this hotel across from our hotel, or there was, it was like a, it wasn't a hotel, but it, it's just like this random um, restaurant that had this brick oven with pizza. So at night, they only opened at night. So I would eat like one or two whole pizzas at night. And that was what I was eating until we had to fly back to um, Maputo, which is the capital, which is where the championship rounds took place. So, I mean, I sprained my ankle, um, you know, I wasn't eating uh, all of these crazy stories and 
it was by design to, to try to make your um, experience very difficult. So again, so the home team could win. And so we end up playing Angola in the semifinals and we're losing the whole game. And then we end up coming back and winning. So now we're like in the championship against Mozambique who, you know, miraculously made it. Um, and back then, I don't think they do this as much now, but I had some referees tell me back then that they were, you know, kind of instructed to make sure the home team gets to the finals and then call a fair game. I mean, I've heard things like that. Um, so you're up against all types of odds. Um, you're up against, you know, the home team. You're up against certain areas like, French speaking versus English speaking, Mozambique is Portuguese. So you've got all of these things that are like working against you. And if the referees are French speaking, they generally don't favor English speaking countries. I mean, it's a lot. So <laughs> we're, um, and mind you, like, like I said, we've had a week of practice and we have people flying in. Like we, I mean, I don't, I still to this day don't even know how we did it. But anyway, we're playing Mozambique. We're losing the whole game. And then in the last three minutes, we just end up coming out and winning. And that was like this on their floor. That was like the single most amazing um, basketball experience I've ever had was when, you know, you're about to go to the Olympics. Like, are you kidding me? And then I found out later that Nigeria didn't even want to send us because they didn't think we could win. So now they get to reap the benefits of us going to Olympics um, and, and did no work to help us. And that's kind of what you deal with when, um, you know, you're dealing with Nigeria. But so we end up winning and um, it's so funny, but to this day, anytime I go to Afrobasket and anytime I see anybody from Mozambique, they're like, oh, you killed us 20 years ago. You know, you, you destroyed our, you like you took our hearts because they were, you know, they were winning and they were favorite. I mean, they're the home team here. It's supposed to win, you know. And so even to this day, they still like, are like, oh, <laughs> uh, but they're like the best, um, they're the best people, the nicest, like they're the ones that are always the most kind of sports. They, they won a lot of sportsmanship awards. Um, and they had a girl at the time playing in the WNBA. Her name was Clarice Machanguana. I don't know if you remember, she played with Tisha Panachero at Old Dominion um, back in the day. So, um, yeah, so that that was, you know, the first and best, you know, years of, in 2003, like almost 20 years ago, um, how things kind of got put on the map as far as Nigerian basketball and you know, I kind of cemented legacy just from doing that. And then, you know, we went to the Olympics and we're the first African country to, to ever win one game. Um, that still hasn't been done, which is sad. Um, and then we won back-to-back -back in 2005 where I was MVP and that was in Nigeria. I should have been MVP in 2003. I, you know, they, they gave it to the home team. I had like 26 and 14 in a championship. Like there's just no way you don't give it, you know, but that's the type of stuff they kind of do. Right. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of, you know, set, set, set the tone and started a legacy for Nigeria. And that's kind of why they, you know, they invite me back every now and then. The ambassador. Um, well, shit, let's uh, jump all the way in cannonball. I remember you talking about the Olympic experience and something that always stood out to me is you remember talking to me about the uh, Olympic village and like just how cool that was that you were able, being able to intermingle in, but yeah, break it down. Like you went to the fucking Olympics. I let motherfuckers know around here. I don't know who you saying is the best to come out of here, but ain't no motherfuckers went to the Olympics. She wasn't just at the Olympics at the ceremony. She was goddamn <laughs> leading a uh, rebounder and second in scoring. Um, behind Lauren Jackson there. You know, I, I, um, I remember like what, you know, you, you set goals, right. And you're thinking like, okay, we want to win at least two games. Cause we want to try to progress to the, you know, winner winning bracket, whatever. And then I remember, I think after a few games, I was like leading and scoring and rebounding. And I'm like, what? <laughs> like that, that was just so 
far from anything I'd ever expected. And I ended up being second in both. Um, but just the fact that I was just like leading the Olympics in scoring and rebounding. And I'm just like, wow. Like when I think about that, because it, it was never a goal, you know, um, we wanted to win two games and we thought we could beat Japan and we thought we could beat Greece and we didn't beat either one. We came really close with Japan. Um, and we didn't, Greece was close, but not that close. We had a legit shot at beating Japan at the time and we didn't. So, um, our first game against Australia, like we came out like really, and we gave them a tough game. And so I'm feeling like excited because I'm just like, okay, you know, we, we could actually make some noise and teams were kind of, you know, a little bit scared of us, but, um, we didn't end up winning any games until our very last game. We only played six games. Uh, I feel like they play more now and the practice or things have changed, but, um, we beat South Korea by four points and it was our last game. And we had a lot of logistical issues. We had a lot of team chemistry issues. We had a lot of issues, period, that we should not have won. won we shouldn't have won that game. Um, and I say that even more so because the next year I played in Korea and they practiced three times a day. They have, they have their young kids, their younger kids that are on the team, but they don't play. So they'll come in and do a workout in the morning. And then there's our practice with like the senior and older people. And then we have another practice as well. So sometimes in South Korea, we were practicing two times a day. Those they were, and they're like methodical machines. You know how those Asian teams are. They do they, I mean, they practice the same thing over and over and over. And so the next year, like when I got to South Korea and I was just like, it made me appreciate that one win so much more because we should not have won that game. I'm not even going to lie. We, we were not more, I mean, we, I don't want to say we weren't more talented, but we were not better prepared. I know for a fact that, you know, South Korea had it, you know, they everything checked, like they're doing everything right. We were doing everything wrong. <laughs> yeah. So, um, it just made me appreciate that win so much more. And, um, yeah, being at the Olympics is one of those things like you dream of, but it's like, how do you even get there? You know, and, and just the fact that that was an opportunity and that's something I did, it's just, it still tops everything in basketball. And like you said, you know, being around the games village and like, you know, seeing Yao Ming walk around and then like, you know, set meeting the, the tiniest little, I think he was like Bahamian. He was like a swimmer who had no chance in hell of ever winning a medal, but he's there you know, being a swimmer and then like, um, seeing old teammates of mine, like that I played with this, you know, in China, seeing them there and then going to the events and watching like track and field. And it just, it's like one of those things that you just, you just looking around all the time. I mean, I met Venus Williams. I took a picture with her and she had a teammate, Shonda Rubin, like they were double, you know, it, it, it's just, it's crazy. Like, it's one of the most amazing experiences and Nigeria would spoil it and they did their best to make it absolutely awful. And they did. Um, but at the same time, it's still one of those things that you just can't top. Nothing tops it. Oh, no. Yeah. There's only a few people on earth. And, and like you said, not a lot of people had that goal. Like I think through all the time I work with players, the only person ever told me that was Garrett Jackson, that he wanted to be an Olympian. And so I would just always, every once in a while, don't forget, you want to be an Olympian, you don't forget. And yeah. I'm sure someday he'll be on one of them coaching staffs. So I'll be like, you, you you, told me. You remember, you like, still got it on the list. Um, yeah. Left and rights all night. Let's uh, we, we went forward ahead a little bit. Let's kind of back up, um, talk about the Hoop Dreams experience back in the gym when you used to be kicking all the young bucks, uh, busting them upside the heads. And then, um, you know, just the, just the environment from there. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, I five elite from there too. Yeah, man. I mean, I think, you know, I, those are some of my favorite memories. Um, just being in the gym, right. Just getting shots up, just being around 
people who play basketball, um, you know, you giving instruction and um, just the culture and the camaraderie that just comes from that. And there weren't a lot of girls there. So I was always happy when I did see some girls. Um, but it doesn't really matter. Um, the work is the work, I always say. It doesn't matter what level you are. You know, you're doing the same work. And the work doesn't change, right? So you're up in there getting shots all the time. And you're getting your conditioning right. Um, which I think is something that's a very lost art is just being in shape. Um, I don't know if these kids are in shape. They like to hoop and they like to do their workouts, but like, can you run? And, you know, certain players are better at distance than sprinting. For me, I was always decent at both. And I always, when I was running in, in college and distance, I would always try to keep up with the guards. And I was pretty much, you know, close enough to them. Um, but that's one of those things I think is a very lost art is just, being in shape, being able to run for days, um, lifting the weights, you know, I don't know. I feel like kids don't do that as much. They, they, they got their trainers and, you know, they're doing all these, you know, things that look cool on Instagram and all the dribbling and blah, blah, blah. But it's like, but can you, can you play all, can you play an entire game, you know, without, can you play hard? for a long period of time, how fast can you recover? You know, things like that. Um, just the, like I said, but just, just being around people who love basketball and who want to work out and just to call that a career for the, sh the period of time that, you know, I was able to play. It's just, it's a blessing and it's some of my most um, fond memories and just, you know, seeing the younger kids, um, what they ended up doing and, you know, just what basketball did for them. And it's just, it's, I, I still, I miss those days. I remember <laughs> Doobie, you would fucking stay up here all day. Cause you know, you, before you get on the court, you got your whole fucking treatment thing. You've been yeah. gay and shit yeah. and you get on the court. And uh, you hear her talking about conditioning. Doobie fucking hated conditioning. But I'm like, you have to come on. We got to do some of these. Yeah. And you, you knew you had to do it, but, she she would hate it but to hear like you hear right now you know the um the level of importance and i remember you um if it wasn't no girls in there you would come right in and bust the kids upside the head what are you doing man get lower man my, both my, my i don't even got knees right here and i'm getting lower than you what the hell is the problem with you right um yeah especially when you're young i mean when i was working out with you a lot that's kind of when my knees were getting a little worse and so conditioning wasn't fun for me. Um, but I, like you said, it was, I, I knew I had to do it as necessary, but yeah, you know, kids that, uh, sometimes they need to be humbled a little bit. <laughs> you don't so, have no problem doing, doing it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They just gonna catch a bow or two from me for sure. Like, think about that. Doobies in the gym. They look, they think it's all oh, some girl or something and she's pivoting pop all up in the chin layup. And running back down like she just didn't hit nothing. Yeah. Yeah, I, I appreciate uh, the era I grew up in because I don't know if I would have been able to play in this soft, like, finesse, no, you know, rough and tumble a little bit. I I definitely um, – I also wonder if I would have just been, like, happy and content just shooting threes all day. I don't think – I love to post it up. I love – the physical aspect of it. I love battling for position. I loved the footwork of just being on the low block. And I don't, I, I just wonder, like, if I grew up in this, you know, in this era, would I just be shooting threes like everybody, you know? Where do you feel that came block. from? Where do you feel that came from for you? As far as like, man, really loving yeah. that part of the game. Like, was it somebody that you watched early? Was it playing certain teams? Like, where, where did that come from or originate? Well, you know, when I was growing up, if you were tall, they just put you down there, right? So you didn't have a choice. Um, but my favorite player was Charles Barkley. I mean, he was a bruiser. And I was undersized. Um, I didn't know how undersized I was until I got to college because I was always pretty tall and pretty much taller than everybody in Portland or Oregon or whatever. Um, but Charles Barkley, I loved. Uh, he had a really sick up and under um, 
he was a rebounder. I loved rebounding. I don't know. It just was something that was innate in me. And like, I just, you know, I wasn't ever the most athletic, Could you know, my vertical is probably like, you know, <laughs> couldn't jump high. Um, but I was always a position rebounder, which is rebounding anyway. Um, but yeah, Barkley was probably the one that I was, I modeled out my game after a little bit. And then when I got to college, um, my coach was just a phenomenal, fundamental teacher. And um, he taught all the basics and got my footwork right, uh, pivots and, you know, up and unders and jump stops and just being able to do a whole bunch of things at the end of a dribble. Um, yeah, I don't know. I just, I, I think like maybe because I was kind of a tomboy, it was, you know, I had two brothers. Um, I didn't mind grinding. I didn't mind playing tough. Um, I'm Nigerian. I think that's part of it because we're, you know, we're generally tough people. Um, we play hard. So yeah, I think it's a combination of those things. But I just really um, still like love the block, the low block. I'm just trying to kind of outsmart, especially because I was like a little undersized, trying to outsmart people or use my body. Um, to get shots off and I didn't get my shot blocked a lot, you know, um, because I knew how to use my body and, you know, coach Bruno taught me a lot of different things. Like, you know, a little jump hook, you got your left and right all night, like you say, um, just to be able to use both hands around the basket, just being crafty. And that, you know, requires a little bit of smarts and, um, just kind of knowing, you know, just how to maneuver around the basket. We would take uh, Doobie with us. She would play in the Valleys League with us. We would take her yeah. to rounds with us, like, go hold it down, yeah. six, seven games. Yeah. Like, they look, oh, it's a girl. Man, we never looked at Doobie, like, with the saying the utmost respect. We, you just was a player. We didn't go like, oh, we got the girl with us. Like, okay, we got to adjust our games. You knew how to fucking play basketball. I was going to say this earlier. Like, whenever we talk basketball and stuff, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know if people do that. I can only speak from my perspective, but like just with you, because you could, you had an IQ, you could fucking clown people. So now you look at like um, a Becky Hammond, some of the did was Lindsay Godley, where some of the different women that are getting into the men's side and coaching and stuff. And then having to um, not, you're already knowledgeable, but then having to gain um, that song called whatever respect. But I just know, I, mean, I always felt really comfortable when you was on our team. You was going to get all the rebounds. You was going to talk and play smart defense. And you are going to yeah. finish whatever we gave it to you. So, like, it's just winning basketball. Yeah. I mean, basketball is basketball. You know, like, if you know it, you know it. It doesn't really matter if you're a male or female, right? Um, but the ones I feel like that have to depend on brain power or an IQ are people that aren't necessarily the most athletically gifted, right? So if it's easy for you, like if you're a super athletic and you can just, you know, run and jump out the gym, you you use that to your advantage, right? And that's how a lot of those players um, play basketball from an athletic standpoint. But when you're not that, like me, when you're someone who can't really, you know, who's not the fastest or the tallest or the quickest or can't jump, you've got to use your IQ, you got to use your brain. And so... You know, it, 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 you, if you know basketball, you know basketball. Now, you, it, <laughs> I think about players, we might have called them yahoos or whatever. But, you know, those ones that just don't know nothing. God, you just can't, you know, can't remember a play. Or you'll just get lost on defense. Or you just, you know, you, it's just like deer in headlights. Like, what do I do when you have to think the game? So if, if you take an athlete's strengths away which is their athleticism now it's like what are you going to do now um, so for me you know when you're smart you you're always going to find a place in basketball what the fuck who the fuck want to fuck with the six shot shooter <laughs> doobie do you understand what you did like i that take right there like is magic and what people need to hear because that's that's like the genesis of basketball. That is the blueprint to basketball. Now, if you get gifted and blessed with those athletic abilities and stuff, so be it. That, that's a wonderful thing. But everybody else who, like us, is normal, you can still have, like you said, a place in the game of basketball. And I think uh, forever, 
Jeff Christensen, I know you know him. Uh, he mm -hmm. said years ago to me, I was like, man, he goes, you told me. I was like, what did I tell you? He goes, talent gets you into the game. Basketball IQ extends your career. For sure. And so most of us, whether it's tall or talent, some got us in, but it's like, how do you acquire, be a student of the game and acquire this information? Um, and then when you get around people like that, a group that is constantly throwing new ideas and challenging stuff you're saying, and, um, it, you know, in a good way, uh, it just keeps leveling your, I mean, look at where things are at basketball wise now and where the fuck we came from. <laughs> right. Are you kidding me? Right. Tell right. me, are you kidding of the me's? Right. Yeah, it, it's, you know, I I think back to our scrimmage at, or when, you know, we played pickup or valleys or whatever. Like, there couldn't, there could only be a certain type of player on our team because you had to know, like, we you if you didn't know how to play, if you didn't know, like, how to move off the ball or whatever, you couldn't have played on our team because you know you just be out there just like you know <laughs> so you have to yeah. like have some basketball iq you know for sure and god bless anybody who has amazing athleticism like a lebron right with the basketball iq then you're just like virtually unstoppable but yeah i mean people think or kids, I don't know if they really realize, like, you actually have to think the game. Like, it's not, you're just not rolling the ball out there and just, you know, doing whatever. There's actually a method to things. And it's not like you can't just, you know, do whatever you want. You have to kind of take what the game gives you and those type of things. And, it, yeah, you have to think. Like, it's a thinking game for sure. And what, if you can, because you, you hit on this a little bit earlier with the with the positioning part of rebounding, with the you know not having that be an athletic um, skill, which I think a lot of people look at it as at face value. Kind of talk about, I mean, I guess and you know you mentioned a little bit with the athleticism being undersized, but how you carved out a role in that, and like how did you develop it? I mean, obviously it's something like well, I need to figure out how to get positioning because it's not going to be jumping over people or just using length. Um, but was there a way that you found, like, even as you got into college, as you continued your career, like, I can work on this to have this be, to continue to get better at rebounding instead of just um, going out and doing it? I, I have, to, I'd have to think back, like, for high school, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean just because I was the tallest, I got the most rebounds, because you guys know, like, just because you're tall doesn't mean you're a great rebounder, right? Um, it's... I know my coach, Coach Bruno, always said this, you have a, you have to have a will to get the ball, right? So you have to want to. You have to want to go get rebounds. That's the first part. Uh, second part is positioning, right? So you always kind of want to be on the inside of a player. Um, and then the other thing I remember him telling me, and I don't know if I did this innately or not, but you watch the flight of the ball. So you kind of, you know, watch where the ball is, you know, coming from and you can kind of sometimes guess where it's going to go. Like if it's on the baseline, right, the opposite baseline and I'm here, it's probably going to bounce, you know, oh, wow. on the opposite side. So it's just things like that, tracking the ball and watching the ball in flight. Uh, because when you're boxing out, you don't just turn and not watch the ball. You're still watching the ball kind of as you're boxing out. Um, having a really good base. Um, I was strong. You know, I was a strong, um, strong player, and your base is really important. It's being able to get low and actually push people out, um, and just desire. I think overall, it's just desire because some people don't like to get hit. They don't like to be touched. You know, they don't want it. any parts of that. Posting up, battling in the post, battling for rebounds. For me, I was like, yeah, let's do this because that's that's what I love. It was just you know my thing. Um, I remember when I got to Africa. They saw me and they thought I was soft because I was light skinned. And so they told me this later, but um, I knew like when I showed up, they were just kind of a lot of teams were just like, you know, eyeing me because I'm light skinned. And that's one of those things they equate with being soft, right? Um, a lot of times, like y'all remember talking about those soft ass Cali, you know what I mean? 
and them light skinned Cali boys on the, on the circuit, you know, they're just pretty and, you know, got the wavy hair, all that. Right. Um, so there's like this perception, but, um, I remember, and it was a very physical game. And I remember I just destroyed these girls like on the nightly. And so in Africa, they were just like, they would try to do anything to take me out whether it's like, I mean, I got punched. I got my braids pulled. I had a girl try to spit on me. They scratched me. I still have scars on my arms, things like that. Um, but I just think like, for me, I've always been really mentally tough. And um, if I know like that's what they're trying to do, well, then I'm not going to let you do that. And I'm going to beat your ass on the court. <laughs> like, I, I, that was just my thing. Like, I'm going to punish you for even, like, trying to do that to me, you know? Um, and the best way of solving all of that is winning. So, I mean, I've had black eyes, um, sprained ankles, been, you know, triple teamed, and the officiating wasn't great back then. Um, so I was going up against a lot. But for me, like I, I said, I was a, I was a strong player. I was not a finesse player, um, kind of a bully, you know, and I was stronger than a lot of people. So it was just, you know, okay, well, you're going to try to do this, and then I'm just going to have to do that. I'm going to have to score on you, or I'm going to have to, you know, whatever, and then ultimately win. So then that solves everything. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's – basketball is such an interesting um, – game because there's so many facets so many layers and so many different types of players and whatnot but yeah I think mentally being mentally tough and you have to be extremely mentally tough to play in Africa you just do there's so many elements that I mean you're fighting against like first of all the distance you travel right so you get there and you're like having to adjust to that and then the um, elements sometimes will get to you um, it's really hot and then sometimes you know you'll get you'll get sick because you're not used to being over there I fought that a lot early but now I can go to Africa and, and not get sick anymore um, then you like I said you're fighting officials you're fighting your own federation not doing stuff properly I mean there's just so many layers to it and so once you end up winning you're just like <sighs> because you fought you're exhausted because you have fought so many things before the games even get there it just makes everything sweeter at the end you mentioned earlier uh WNBA career and playing in that for a bit um kind of looking at stuff right now where do you feel like like kind of the state of the game is for them right now where the league is and just I mean, how much different it is than when you were playing it. It's so different um, on so many levels. One being that the amount of teams is less than, than when I was around. Um, there's less teams, so it's super competitive. I mean, you see like all of these players with names that aren't in the WNBA because there's just not enough spots. Um, you've got social media has changed everything, right? So you've got so much more visibility uh, than you did in terms of social media. But back, you know, 20 years ago, I mean, you still had, you know, seven, 8,000, 10,000 people coming to games. Um, Houston was rocking. And, you know, I got there after they won their fourth in a row. <laughs> but, um, but they still had this amazing fan base and, you know, people came to games. And I don't think the, the, the attendance doesn't seem to be um, in person as much as it was back then. I know certain places like Seattle are better than others, but then you but you also have so many other ways now to watch games. You know, the streaming and you know, NBA TV and whether it's ESPN, ABC, whatever. Um, I just think the next thing is expansion because. You know, they're trying to bring a team back to Portland, I've heard. Um, you know, I've heard maybe like Philly, um, Bay Area, and then maybe a place or two that isn't a typical NBA franchise city. So, yeah, it's just, um, I think it's 
gone in the right direction and I think it still is fighting that respect you know that other women's sports have and I think that's because of the demographic and the makeup of the women in the league that that opposed to other sports um but you know it's still a, a game that that still you're still fighting you know you're still fighting it to grow it and and that's all over the world you know it doesn't matter it's not just america it's just one of those things that isn't your typical even though i don't understand why it's not your typical sport that people would talk about like a tennis for example right um, but it's a it's a sport that everybody plays everywhere, you know, in, in all areas and all levels in the entire world. But it's still, you know, fighting for that recognition, I think, that it deserves. Here's a story. I remember it was me and Cleet drove up to Seattle when you were playing <laughs> comments against yes. um, the storm back then. And uh that's when, because Adia was playing for them. So then we went up there and you guys connected. Adia Barnes, who's now head coach at University of Arizona Women. Um, it's like fun, you know, when they were in the national championship a few years ago, also I was like, man, that's Doobie's best friend. That's one of her closest friends from back in the day. Um, I remember how cool that was. And you were unpacking like, man, it's it's fine. And Danny B was like, man, it ain't as sweet as it looked, Beans. Like they ain't doing us right, man. <laughs> I mean, I, it was really difficult. I remember one time Van Chancellor being so annoyed at me because I was exhausted. We got on like a 5 a.m. flight on Southwest and I feel like we flew to Phoenix, I mean, or something. And then when you get off the plane and you got to shoot around, I'm like, I can't even function. You know, 5 a.m. flights, are awful anything in the morning right but then it's like my whole day is ruined and now i mean he i remember him like going off on me for like not because i'm i was exhausted um the travel was really hard i i know they're still battling that um they might have a little bit better but not really um you know there's a lot of college teams that travel better than the WNBA, and that's one of the main things that i hear and constantly reading about is the private jets and you know the travel because that's hard it's really hard to have to um travel that way and then you know play a game that night kind of thing like <laughs> it just was like I was, I was a zombie and it was very difficult um so that's a financial issue you know and i i still think that um when if and whenever that gets solved i mean i think you'll have a lot uh, different experiences and i remember you know last year kind of reading about you know the sparks being stuck in the airport overnight i mean just like wild stuff because they couldn't get out because you know their flight got canceled and then you know so that's um yeah that that was tough and you know i'm talking from 20 years ago and things have gotten better but, but there still is that travel issue which is you know a big deal because like if you don't get if you're not properly rested you know rest is a really important thing and at least you know the nba players they can get on a plane right after the game and be out and you know land and go where they need to go but you know sometimes in the WNBA it doesn't work that way and that's tough for sure these are the top 150 players in the world and they're mm -hmm. traveling like everybody else maybe sometimes worse than the fans are yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you had Brittany Griner, you know, be harassed, you know, in some airport somewhere to where, yeah, because you're like mixing with the regular population and probably every, you know, your 99% of your experiences will be positive. But it is kind of weird to just see a professional team just kind of like, you know, with the regular population of people. And then of course, like someone like Brittany, who's, you know, story, some people really s supported her and some people thought she should still be over in, you know, Russia. So you get those kind of fans that, you know, come at you crazy, like, yeah, that's crazy, crazy. Doobie, 
Let's talk about those I-5 boys. <laughs> I know you're really proud. But talk a little bit about just your experience with them back on the trips. Any stories or anything or just how you felt about it, and then just kind of to see where things are are with them now. Because you had them yeah. guys in the wing. Yeah, I looked at those kids as, you know, little brothers, little, little brothers um, now, you know, that they're grown. But back then it was kind of like, you know, the team mom, I guess you could say. Um, really exciting, talented team. Um, they were really good kids. Uh, it was just fun to watch them grow up and have their paths and, you know, all play D1, most of them. And um, I ran into Stephen Holt a couple of days ago at the Pro-Am, and it was just crazy to see him. He's like on year, I think he said 10, 11, 12, 13, something like that. You know, like they just have been playing for that long, um, you know, has a baby on the way. Um, then kind of last year, at the uh, finals with the Celtics, you had Garrett on staff and Potsy was there and Mike was there and it was just like this little mini reunion and I'm just looking at these like, you know, they're all like six, seven and just looking at them like, wow, I remember what, I mean, they were always taller than me, but they were young and, you know, it was just really a, a cute reunion. And then um, the stories that I can remember, you know, a lot of, rap music in the cars a lot of crazy driving but the worst is these boys smell so bad like this like how can y'all smell like this all y'all like and then your room smells like that and the car smells like just the the teenage the smell of a teenage boy is just like nothing other how do y'all smell so bad? How? Like, that was, I just feel like, can y'all get out the, get out of my car? Get out of my car, because y'all stink. Um, saying this right here, just like this. Why do y'all smell like this? Did y'all take showers? Man, get up out of here. I mean, you wake up smelling like this? Like, what are you? Because <laughs> you, hey, and then you, then you go back to your hotel room and just sit in your nasty clothes and play video games all the time. Go shower. Go shower first. Um, yeah, no, Vegas was fun. Vegas was always fun. And then I remember being in uh, grad school in Buffalo and driving over to meet y'all in, was it? Akron. You drove, Akron. I was like, how the hell did you get here? You was like, oh no, you just go right, right around the lake. Well, it's, it's a straight shot. Yeah. Oh, and I was looking for any chance to get up out of Buffalo. Any chance I could get up out of Buffalo, I was taking. And it was just, I remember that was a a uh, uh, fun time over there. Um, I remember having this big old Hummer. I don't remember what tournament. We were in Vegas, so I remember having the Hummer and everybody wanted to be in my car because it was a Hummer. Um, you always had the nice one for whatever reason. Well, you know how Clee would you. So Clee would get you. You would have some nice one, and then we would have the other two vans. The, van. <laughs> the kids were trying to jump in with you. You only a certain amount. <laughs> um, I remember the was it the travel lodge when we was in vegas that first thing. Look, you oh. saved us if she wouldn't have been on a trip we probably would have had to stay there she called e right away it was like we're not staying here we can't. We're, not staying. we're not staying here and then we and, and did he call he might have called bano and Bano. He helped us where were we the cannery the cannery yes because ooh. That was probably the worst of the worst experiences, right? I remember just kids coming out and being like, there's like hair in the sink or something. The, the smell, oh, it's just, oh, that was bad. That was bad. Luckily, like we got out of that. But it was always um, fun to watch them compete. Um, fun for me, just as a basketball person, you know. But also, I just felt like Portland was never really on the map. And I don't know if that team kind of put Portland on the map, but they that I just felt like Portland's finally getting, you know, some recognition for having some hoopers. Um, Cause I think more so it was Seattle, right? Seattle always had their, 
but no one really seemed to talk about Portland, even though we had Terrell Brendan and then we had, you know, Damon and, you know, we had some people come up out of Portland, but I feel like that group might have just kind of put Portland on the map a little bit more. That's what we were trying to do. You already know how prideful we are about our city and then having that chip, like feeling like, um, not not getting the right notoriety. We'll shoot the segue and speak about that. Talk about your damn uh, brother, you know, being a head coach in the NBA. Like, yeah, you know, um, super proud. Um, I wouldn't. I'd have to think back. Like, it's funny. I you know I came back to Portland almost a year ago had to clean out the garage and all this um, and was going through stuff. And I took out a book that was like my senior book, you know, and I had written stuff in it and it was like, tell me about your family. Da, 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 da. So I was writing something and I was reading and it was just like, it said something about emails, my little brother, you know, he, he loves basketball, but he gets on my nerves because he's always watching me to watch tape with him. <laughs> I would have never, I would have never, you know, remembered that. Um, but I mean, in high school, like, I don't know what games he taped, probably taped, you know, Michigan and college games on the VCR and would watch them, you know? So he was always asking me to watch tape. And I'm like, no, I'm not watching basketball tape with you. Like, I got to go to work, or whatever, right? Um, so we always had that in him. And then y'all always played, you know, tried to find a game where you managed to find your games, pick up wherever, and you guys go all over the city. Um, so... I remember him, I think it was probably 2005, 2006, something like that, him saying that either, you know, Isaiah Thomas and, you know, Nate McMillan both were like, you'd be a great coach one day, blah, blah, blah. And so knowing Ime and just knowing that he's always been kind of in, you know, bas basketball was his entire life, um, it's just it's kind of a natural progression. And I think, you know, he got – really lucky and fortunate to end up um, being hired by pop and kind of making that transition very smoothly. Cause you didn't really have to sit out and wait, or I don't want to say grind, but it was kind of an opportunity that was there for him. And a lot of players don't necessarily have that smooth transition from, you know, playing ball to um, their next career, so to speak. So, yeah, I mean, I'm, I think anybody who knew him or knows him or knew him growing up, this isn't really a shock because, I mean, he's always been a cerebral guy. Um, he was never great at anything on court, but he kind of did everything well. Um, he didn't have a, like, he was an all-around player, right? So he played, he was a guard because he was always shorter. Um, in middle school, he was shorter, so he played the guard, and then he, you know, played the post, and so he kind of did everything. Um, whereas me, I was just always, you know, and, and James were always tall, so they just put us in the post. Um, so he was a little bit different than us in that way. Uh, I remember, you know, placing third my senior year in um, at Benson and then, you know, leaving and going to college. And then, like, the next year he's in the championship. I'm like, oh, my God. Like, you know, so it was just really, really cool, you know, to – I wish I would have been able to see, you know, him play in high school a little bit more, but um, yeah, I mean, he's, he had a really tough road. Um, he's had injuries and, you know, it's been cut and then, you know, our dad passing away while he's trying to make the blazers. And then he goes out and has a game of his life, like the next day. I mean, it's just a lot of things that he's had to deal with um, and overcome. And, you know, we're just, just, super proud you know really excited for this next journey with him um yeah and just hopefully you know winning a championship one year i remember the first year when they made it to the um he got to coach the all-star game so the first year he's coaching they were best team in the west so he's coaching the all-star game so i went down there and hung out and I knew something was different. So like you're talking about the transition and how seamless it was. Um, I'm down there in the morning after breakfast, hanging out with him in the room. And he's like, hey man, you gotta get out of here. I'm like, what you mean? He's like, we're, we're about to have the meeting in my room. I'm like, the fuck? What? 
why the cook why y'all you the lowest on the totem pole why, why they come right down here you know, you know what i'm saying like and he's yeah. like well, but i thought of then when i left i'm like um he's grooming him he's like giving him additional responsibilities to accelerate his development like i can look back at it now like just and then i it like took me a little bit of time but seeing from that trip pop was throwing all type of stuff at him to make him almost be like um he was a top assistant or on his way to be being a head coach um and already setting the tone and you already know your brother never ever wanted to be a coach ever he frowned upon it um but we know how obsessed he is with basketball. He didn't want to leave the fucking game. And right. I remember when he came to that uh, crossroads and, and I'm like, what the fuck do you mean? Like, of course. And uh, I still got to this day, the card that Isaiah, it's in my wallet. The card that Isaiah gave him telling him about, um, you know, that he thought he's going to be a coach because he's only there on two 10 days with the Knicks. Right. <laughs> yeah. like so this is not like, he had him for four seasons. Like, I think right. he'd be a coach, son. Right. Two 10 days, 14 days. Yeah. And it was that I, the car is like, a, it's like a, a kind of like a, a big saying about you know, just being a man and uh, and following your goals and stuff. So I'll, I'll, I'll send a screenshot to you after. I wish I would have had that here. But then, yeah, right after that, he goes to, um, well, even before the Blazers, I think it was Jim Clemens. With the Lakers when he was in training, Lakers. had told him, "Man, I think you're going to be a coach." Jim Clemens, defensive-minded mm-hmm. coach, uh, always with Phil Jackson, and then when he was with the Blazers, Nate McMillan um, told him that right away. And then obviously Pop when he was down there, so the, the thread was there. I just know when he was with I Five Elite, the kids would go say something to him. He goes, "I'm not a fucking coach. Go tell, go ask being." A- <laughs> that, that was his saying. Yeah, I know he liked being around that team and and. Um doing the workouts and skill work, but yeah, not the coaching part for sure. Um, but it's like for someone like him who loved the game, so like, what else would he have done with it? Like, I mean, it's, he's, he's got this personality where he's very stoic and very composed under pressure. Um, so it's good for, you know, good for coaching. And then also the love of the game, obviously. Um, and just, being, you know, eat, sleep, you know, breathing basketball for so long. But then also he works really hard, works really, really hard. And when you think about, you know, watching tape in high school, that kind of thing. I mean, he's always had that in him um, because I'll be honest, he was our least, <laughs> least accomplished student in the family. Wasn't the best. James was the best student. Um, I was our best athlete. And then Ime was kind of just there. You know, he didn't really have that place in either one of those. Right. So I'm it just makes me so much happier about it for that reason, because he kind of, you know, my mom always used to say, you know, well, he kind of struggled and you guys set the path or set the tone or whatever. And you know, he was, she, she said he was always trying to keep up. And I don't remember those things. And I know she was, she told me those things. Um, so, and he was very uh, devious. He was a little, little devil, like a little devil child. Um, so he got in a lot of trouble. He's very hyper, uh, very aggressive, um, very um, high strung and high energy. And it's so opposite of what he is now because he's just very chill and calm um but yeah i'm you know so proud and he just is so blessed and so lucky and um you know i would come in the house and vitalis would go will you talk to him for me please he's not he won't listen to nothing i'm saying being why can't he be like you (laughs) why can't he cut his hair like you cut his hair hair off look how nasty that's he's oh (laughs) yes The braids. Oh, my dad was so upset when he would grow that afro and braids. Oh, it was just like the biggest insult, you know. Because Nigerians are very clean cut and a little conservative, right? So they're they're not into like, you know, looking like that. Um, but yeah, he um, 
definitely had to find his way a little bit. He, and, you know, just the way he, he left high school, went to JUCO, then went to San Francisco, which is the wrong school. Then, you know, you're set, you, you lose a year. Then you come to Portland State, then you get hurt. I mean, there was just so many obstacles. Um, and he really started from the bottom, you know, was on, on I think, FedEx story. I, I mean, FedEx, like, you know, one of my high school teammates, Ray Sean, um, she lived either above or below him in some apartment in Southeast. And she see it, she said every time she saw him, like, what are you about to go do? Go who? Go work out. So he was like working out constantly and then working for, you know, UPS or FedEx or something at night. Um, yeah, just, just grinding. So it's just really a um, beautiful story. Yeah, I would leave. I would go home because Tate was just born. So I had to go home, you know, 9 a.m. from 3 a.m. And uh, he made, he, I remember when he was creating a schedule, he was like, well, I'm just going to go work out right after because I'll already be up and stuff. And then I'll just, I'll nap. And then I, you know, I'd hit him later on. He'd be napping and then we would connect later on and go play or somewhere. But we were lifting and stuff like a lot that time. And he was taking his time, um, uh, like with his development. Um, because of he had had that setback with the um, ACL and it was his yeah. second one. So he wasn't going to do it. So many like serendipitous or fortuitous type thing, you know, and then we go to the practice facility and he's out there. And then um, Panaggio and Herb Brown, they just love him because he's going heads up with Bonzi and all those guys. So they got him into the uh, D-League draft at the time. Like he didn't, same kind of seamless transition like he had to go coach with pop in the spurs you know he didn't have to like just fight him he had this vouch from these nba um, veteran coaches that got him into the d league draft and then he goes to the north charleston low gators i remember i said man you got to go there with nate james man he he just came out from duke he go man he's <laughs> he was giving it to him that's what he told me he was like man i'm giving it to him every day so i'm thinking you come from portland state this dude is, you, you get what I'm saying? Like, it's just like yeah. get coming, this David and what is it, uh, Goliath or whatever. Like, yeah. um, but you, like you said, him being stoic, he would always be able to meet every challenge. I'd always, we'd always say, uh, you know, it's just basketball, man. At the end of the day, it's just basketball. Like, go, go do what you normally do. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, he, um, like, like coming from Portland State, right? And I remember him talking about working out with the Blazers and Bonzi was like the strongest player he'd ever played against, right? So Bonzi was like super strong. And then um, I remember when he made the Blazers and he had gone to summer league with Kuntel Woods and like was hooping, you know? He had like 27 points and like was hooping out there. And I was just like, okay, maybe this year, right? And so... I remember um, when he got the invite to Blazers, and I said, "Well, why is there why why are there so few people in camp?" He's like, "I don't care." He's like, "I'm making this team." I was just like, "Okay, you know, all right," because uh, I, you know, I'm used to seeing like rosters of like 20 some people, and there was maybe 15. I mean, it was a very tiny training camp. And just the way he ended up there, because Aaron, you know, failed a physical. Like, it's just it's just a crazy story. And then he ends up starting because because he probably, you know, had a great IQ and he worked hard. Just to just like to be in to be in Portland, like where you grew up. I mean, it was such a, you know, it's such a beautiful story, even though, you know, our dad passed away like right before he made the team. So you never really saw him play. Um, and remember that one game we came to, all of us were there. And I remember I was pissed because he didn't get in the game and we're all there, right? And I'm thinking like, God, he's not going to make this team. This is bullshit. You know, it's just like so I remember mad. trying to calm you down and calm Vital. I was like, they gonna, he going to play tomorrow night, like trying to – because, yeah, like I was disappointed too. Like yeah. we, we were all excited. Like, man, you can't explain it, man. Like it's like – He's going to play, and he had said, Nate had said he was going to play, remember, towards what? the end, and for yeah. whatever reason, it didn't happen. It Man, didn't. I just remember looking at Vitalis. He was so pissed. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we were all mad. Oh, my goodness, man. And then, like, 
for you know for him to to you know pass away like the next game like that he was actually you know supposed to play in like that hurts that still hurts because he never got to see him you know play but then to like have to deal with that and then going and making an NBA roster like it's like that the mental toughness is just it, I couldn't have done it I could not have done it he played that perfect game the very mm-hmm. next game against Utah yeah six for six whatever he had like yeah. 16 points yeah. six rebounds yeah. six assists and was like um you know said he could hear his dad talking to him through the game and just um like felt his presence uh and I remember he was like I was like, what you gonna do? I think I'm just gonna go. Like mm-hmm. he just kind of made a quick decision. He didn't really think much about it. Um, and they were like, why are you here? <laughs> like, what are you doing here? Like he he's said, like, Nate kept saying it. He's like, no, nah, I just want to play. Yeah. Simplified it. Um, and then, you know, coming out, starting the most games that year, uh, that dude, I was going to school that year at Portland State. And so, He's getting done with practice, you know, noon or something. He's blowing my phone. I'm in class, man. Like, I'll come down in two hours right down the park blocks. Oh, yeah. He's like, well, what you doing, man? Every day's a Friday for me. It'd be a Tuesday. <laughs> Every day's a Friday for me. That's what he, he was just had, like a kid in a candy store having so much fucking fun being in the city. And he would do those, um, you know, they give you the appearances. They want you to go to the boys and girls. Oh, yeah, yeah. He, Oh man, I, I, he, he'd go. He would have the two hour. Like, I'm gonna go do appearance real fast, and then we can get get food afterwards. Like, yeah, because nobody wanted to do them, and you know he was probably what making the minimum or whatever. So none of the nobody, you know, really wanted to go do those appearances. So he's like, well, I'm gonna do everyone. I'm gonna get paid, like whatever, you know. And then probably, you know, he's from here, so probably meant a little bit more. But I remember that too, because he's like, no one ever wants to do them. He's like, I will. Did the coat drive? I remember being so proud. Like had all the coats around the, um, in the bins at the uh, the Rose Garden, whatever. Just an amazing um, time. And then now, look where he's at. And he didn't hire these young bucks along with him. I talked to Garrett last week for like ninety minutes in Mo's, and you know they're the head of player development. Wild, right? I the know. young whippersnappers. Yeah. The, so the, stinky, the stinky kids. Yes. And I said that to them when I saw them. I'm like, y'all used to smell so nasty. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's it's really cool. Um, it's really cool to see. And it's really, you know, I, I feel some pride, you know, just because I've seen them and watched them grow up. And um, they're good kids, really good kids. And they're not kids anymore, but they will forever be kids <laughs> to me. But yeah. That's how you're going to always refer to them, even sure. when Mosey and it got gray hairs on his beard. Moses is a whole 30 something, but he's still my little bro kid. With three kids. Yeah. With married. Three kids. Exactly. A whole grown man. But I always talk, I still call him kids for sure. I told Gary, I said, man, you know, we, we about to get you on. He's like, oh, man, you know, he, this motherfucker wants to be under underground. <laughs> <laughs> I said, man, you big time now. He's been cut all that out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, they're, it's, it's an exciting time for them. I, I, I'm excited for that team. I'm excited for the youth and, you know, have a young, energetic staff. Get them going. Yep. No, nah, and I know that um, just how he made things and uh, that this is a really fun, like, project, something that he knows instead of coming into something, this is something you can really – move and create and um develop it yep put your stamp on it because they need it <laughs> they need some direction oh yeah switch that whole brand of basketball over and get that good brand like you said uh no nah, y'all can't play with us man this ain't yeah, you don't do that brand doobie this is so much fun you already know we can do this shit forever we got yeah, we got stories we have to hide <laughs> <laughs> we could definitely talk all night for sure yeah. Love you so much. Thank you for doing this. You're welcome. Appreciate you jumping on. You're welcome. This is fun. Anytime, fellas. Well, we might have to get part two um, from the finals live next year from the finals. Hey. <laughs> I think, you know, it's going to be hard. They, um, that, that West is a beast. 
West is a beast. And, you know, I, I will say, you know, when you're young and you play hard, you're going to beat some teams that just decide to take the nights off, you know, whatever. But I, I was looking at, you know, like the top 10 teams and it was just like, where are they going to sneak up in? Cause they got to try to sneak up in somewhere in there. But um, yeah, I mean, we'll see. I think everybody's excited. You know, I think they're having um, a, a coach that has a good leadership style and has some respect and, you know, a background with accomplishments that, you know, is different from the previous coach they had. So, It'll be interesting. It'll be interesting to watch. Can't wait. No doubt. No doubt. Well, again, thank you for jumping on and being and, and sharing and spending some time with us. We appreciate it. You're welcome. Bon dubious. All right, y'all. All right. Much love, awesome. Doobie. Okay. Bye. If you like this episode of Let's Talk Hoops, make sure to follow, subscribe, and share to keep the conversation going.